Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. I'm delighted to tell you I have a sponsor for today's video. Let me tell you about Audible. It has the largest selection of audiobooks, including new releases and bestsellers. As a member, you get access to the Plus catalogue and also one credit for any title in the premium section each month. You can get a free trial for 30 days. There is also a limited time offer of 60% on your first three months of Audible, so $5.95 a month. Visit audible.com slash thecrimereel or text thecrimereel, it's all one word, to 500-500. There is such a vast range with thousands of titles. My preferred type of audiobook is self-help books and autobiographies. And the last one I listened to was the brilliant Louis Theroux and his With Strange Times in Television. To find out more, visit audible.com slash The Crime Reel or text The Crime Reel to 500 500. Goodbye. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Soman Banerjee, who would later go by his nickname, Steve. Somen was born into a successful family of fourth generation printers in India on the 8th of October 1946. He spent his childhood in western India and as an adult developed a love of travel. He left India sometime in the late 1960s spending some time in Canada before settling in Playa del Rey near Los Angeles. His first job in the US was working as a caretaker for the toy company Mattel. However, he was driven and ambitious and wanted to own his own business. With money borrowed from a friend, Steve bought a mobile petrol station which he managed whilst remaining on the lookout for more lucrative business ventures. In 1975, Steve bought a failing Los Angeles rock and roll bar called Round Robin. He changed the name to Destiny 2. It is unclear why he chose the name of Destiny 2 as there was not a Destiny 1, but it may have been to give the impression of a more successful chain of businesses. Determined to make this venture a success, he changed the bar to a disco to capitalise on the trends of the 1970s. However, he struggled to get people through the door and the business was floundering. In 1977, Steve met Bruce Naheen. Bruce was a law student at Loyola Marymount University who came to the club looking for a quiet place to study during the day. The two soon became friends and ultimately Bruce would become Steve's legal advisor. Steve tried everything to make the club a success, from dance lessons to backgammon nights and even resorted to foul play. In March 1979, Steve attempted to get someone to burn down Moody's Disco, a competing nightclub in Santa Monica. However, only minor damage was sustained at the venue. A second arson attack on Red Onion in Marina del Rey was also unsuccessful. It wasn't until a man by the name of Paul Snyder walked into Steve's life that his fortunes began to change. Paul was a nightclub promoter from Canada. He had recently seen a gay male review performance and suggested to Steve that he created a male dance group who was solely there to entertain women. In return for his business idea, Paul wanted to MC the event. Steve discussed it with Bruce, who thought it was a bad idea, but Steve decided to forge ahead regardless. Soon after, in 1979, Steve launched a male exotic dance night for ladies only. At the time, it was a new concept in the US, entering into an industry that had previously always focused on women entertaining men. The club was renamed Chippendales, the name being inspired by the knockoff wooden furniture in the club based on the work of Thomas Chippendale, and the legendary male dance troupe was born. Flyers were posted around Los Angeles advertising that the Chippendales would be presenting exotic male dancers and only ladies would be admitted to the show. After trying every gimmick he could think of to make the club a success, it would seem that Paul's idea had finally given Steve the winning formula. The first night was a huge success with over 600 guests attending in a nightclub that was only licensed for around half that amount. The planning for the first show was rushed and the dancers had no clear plan of what they were meant to be doing. The men stripped to their jock straps, some of which fell off resulting in total nudity and just a couple of weeks after the Chippendales launched, the club was raided by the police. Three dancers and three customers were arrested for engaging in lewd acts and Steve was arrested and charged with providing entertainment without a license. Despite this, 
The business was booming, not least in part to Paul's girlfriend at the time, Dorothy Stratton. Dorothy was a Playboy playmate and the club soon came to the attention of Hugh Hefner. It became a hangout for many of the in crowd from the Playboy mansion. Inspired by the Playboy bunnies, it was decided that the male dancers would wear black spandex pants along with the bow ties, collars and cuffs which would become their signature look. They would treat their customers like royalty, with the dancers doting on the women, pouring their drinks and lighting their cigarettes. Steve was quoted in the Los Angeles Times as saying that the Chippendales were enhancing the cause of women's lib by providing a place where women can go and look at men. As previously agreed with Steve, Paul emceed the early shows. However, he really wasn't very good at it. He lacked charm or charisma and failed to engage with the audience. Despite bringing him the idea that turned his failing business around, Steve fired him without a second thought. At around the same time, Dorothy, who was by now Paul's wife, became Playmate of the Year and was cast in the movie They All Laughed. Dorothy began an affair with the film's director, Peter Bogdanovich, and Paul and Dorothy separated. On the 14th of August 1980, Paul broke into the house which they had once shared and shot Dorothy in the face before turning the gun on himself. Meanwhile, the Chippendales were going from strength to strength. The show was running three times a week and the club was now a highly profitable business. Steve remained in the shadows and outside of the business lived a very private life. He was however ruthlessly competitive and driven by money. He was notoriously cheap, paying the men almost nothing. He continued to promote the club, not caring about the capacity limits or any of the laws which needed to be adhered to. The club was raided on multiple occasions, and after news of these raids became public, the queues for the club seemed to get even longer. It was rumoured that Steve himself may have called in the reports of overcrowding as a way of getting free publicity. The club was also involved in various lawsuits, the most notable of which was brought by Don Gibson, a young law student in Los Angeles. After the Chippendale show had finished each evening, men were allowed into the club, another way in which Steve was increasing revenue. However, it became well known that black men were refused entry and made to wait in a line outside the club. Those close to Steve believed that it was because he thought that white women would not come to a club with too many black men. Don decided to set up his own sting operation. Don, who is black, met with two of his white friends and headed to the club. Deliberately, Don was the smartest dressed within the group. When he approached the doorman, he was asked for his membership card. As he didn't have one, Don was asked to leave. His friends then approached the same doorman and were immediately let into the club despite not having membership cards. Don filed a complaint and an investigation followed. Whilst waiting for this investigation to be completed, Don received a call from a car rental company who had found a batch of papers in one of their cars with his contact details on them. When Don reviewed the papers, he discovered that they were from a private investigation company who had been employed by Steve to follow him. According to an unnamed Chippendale employee, Steve planned to hire a sex worker to pick up Don and then frame him by planting drugs. Steve planned to use this information to blackmail Don into changing his story. Eventually, the case was settled when Steve's attorneys agreed to pay $85,000 in damages and then stated that they would employ more people of colour. By 1981, the club had become so popular that Steve was looking for ways to expand. He brought in the Emmy award-winning producer, Nick DeNoyer, to become the Chippendales choreographer with the hope of producing a more theatrical show. Nick, with his background in television, wanted to develop more of a storyline for the show with characters for the dancers. Nick found a venue for the Chippendales in New York, a club called Magique, which was significantly bigger and better than the Los Angeles venue. Whilst initially working well together, the relationship between Steve and Nick soon deteriorated. There was an intense rivalry between the two men, and as preparations were being made to open the New York club, they were at loggerheads over the direction of the business. Nick was personable and started to receive a lot of press attention. The press often referred to him as the founder of the Chippendales, which enraged Steve. The New York club opened to incredible reviews and soon attracted a celebrity crowd. Nick was reportedly hard to work for, being relentlessly demanding with the dancers. They had to eat a certain way and train continuously to stay in shape. 
However, they were soon becoming stars in their own right, and suddenly the men were being booked to appear on TV talk shows, leading to nationwide fame. The relationship between Steve and Nick broke down completely, and they met in a restaurant to come to an agreement about the business. On what would become known as the napkin deal, Steve and Nick agreed that they would split the rights to the New York club, but Nick wanted his success acknowledged financially. The two men agreed that Nick would have full creative control, along with 50% of the profits from any touring show in perpetuity. At that point, there was no touring show, and Steve readily agreed to the deal, thinking it was basically worthless. Nick knew otherwise. He created a touring show with the Chippendales, which made a small fortune. Steve was furious about how much money Nick was earning from the tour, and the act which he believed belonged solely to him. At the height of his success, Steve was earning around $8 million per year. He owned several homes, including a large estate near the Pacific Ocean, and was also making money from real estate deals. He reportedly idolised Walt Disney and wanted to develop an adult amusement complex. However, all of this still wasn't enough for him. Enraged by the money that Nick was making, he decided to take a competing Chippendale show on tour in the southern United States. With two shows a night, this was also a resounding success. When Nick found out, he began legal action against Steve for violating the terms of their agreement, the napkin deal. Nick had reached breaking point and decided to formulate a new dance group, along with a calendar completely separate from the Chippendales. He worked from his office on the 15th floor of a block in Times Square. On the 7th of April 1987, Steve was working in Los Angeles and Nick was in his office in New York. While sitting at his desk, Nick was approached by a man who shot him in the face and then promptly left the building. A co-worker heard the shots and immediately called the emergency services, but sadly, 45-year-old Nick had died instantly. At that time, the murder rate in New York City was particularly high. A police investigation followed and it was soon discovered that Nick had been incredibly demanding and difficult to work with. He had many enemies and the police department had little to go on. Various theories such as a break-in, random murder, organised crime or a business dispute were all considered and business acquaintances interviewed. Steve was among those questioned but was not considered a suspect as he was in a restaurant in Los Angeles at the time of the murder. Despite all this, the show went on. With Nick out of the picture, Steve bought back the touring rights for the Chippendales from Nick's family for $1.3 million and became fully in control once again. Overall, the business continued to grow, but the LA club had started to fail. With ongoing lawsuits and violations for overcrowding, Steve eventually lost his liquor license and the fire department closed the club down. With revenue from touring, calendars and the New York club still very high despite the Los Angeles closure, the Chippendales remained a resounding success. In 1991, they completed a three-week sold-out show at the Strand Theatre in London and then a highly lucrative European tour followed. At one point, there were 120 Chippendale dancers touring in five separate groups across Europe. However, Steve still wasn't satisfied. Other male exotic dance groups were starting to form to cash in on the craze and one in particular was on Steve's radar. A male dance group called Adonis, which included at least three ex-Chippendale dancers, was starting to enjoy significant success. In 1991, Adonis were performing in the seaside resort of Blackpool in England. During the performance, one of the dancers, Reed Scott, was approached by his producer and asked to leave the stage. Reed was met by two men in suits who identified themselves as FBI agents. They explained that they had discovered a plot to kill Reed together with two other ex-Chippendale dancers. Understandably, Reed was terrified, but he continued to perform, reportedly sleeping with a knife under his bed for the remainder of the European tour. An FBI agent in Las Vegas had received a call from an informant known only as Strawberry. This informant detailed how he had been hired to carry out a hit on three Adonis employees. He had been given an eyedropper bottle which contained cyanide in order to kill the three men by cyanide injection. He had travelled to England to complete the job but when he arrived he had got cold feet and returned to the US. Strawberry informed the FBI that the man who had hired him was Ray Cologne. 
The FBI raided Ray's house and found the 46 grams of cyanide in a bag with a basic skull and crossbones drawn on the side. This amount of cyanide would be enough to kill over 200 people. Ray was arrested and charged with conspiracy and murder for hire. It was soon discovered that Ray, a former Palm Springs police officer, was Steve's go-to guy for literally whatever he needed. After seven months in jail, Ray finally agreed to cooperate with the FBI in exchange for a reduced sentence. Not only did Ray describe how Steve had demanded he facilitate the murders of the three Adonis dancers, he also described how Steve had got him to hire a man by the name of Gilberto Rivera Lopez to kill Nick four years earlier. With Ray's cooperation, the FBI set up a sting operation in order to gain evidence of Steve's role in the crimes. However, as Ray had been in jail for seven months at this point, they needed a feasible excuse for why he was suddenly out on bail. Ray had kidney disease, a fact known by Steve, and so Ray was released under the excuse that he was having special treatment for this kidney issue. On the 23rd of June 1992, Ray, wearing a recording device, met Steve at an IHOP restaurant in Santa Monica. Steve was obviously paranoid and insisted meeting Ray in the toilets at the restaurant. Whilst Ray attempted to engage him in conversation, Steve would write down his answers before ripping them up and flushing them down the toilet. The meeting was fruitless, nothing of any use was captured on the recording device. A new plan was drawn up. In an unusual move, the FBI arranged a passport and disguise for Ray to support a cover story that he was on the run overseas. They travelled with him to Europe, where Steve agreed to meet him in a hotel room in Zurich. The meeting went on for several hours, with the FBI listening from the hotel room next door. Ray deliberately avoided talking about the crimes so that he did not make Steve suspicious. Eventually, Steve began to talk about their past. Among other things, he asked Ray if the authorities knew about the D. This was the men's code word for the murder, and also if the FBI were aware that he had given Ray the money for the gun. Finally, the authorities had evidence of Steve's involvement, and on the 2nd of September 1993, Steve was charged with conspiring to kill the three Adonis dancers. Soon after, he faced additional charges, most significantly for the murder of Nick Denoyer, along with racketeering and arson. Having told Ray during the recorded meeting that he would either kill himself or return to India to start a new life if he was ever caught, he was held without bail awaiting trial. If found guilty, Steve faced life in prison and a fine of up to $1.75 million. However, on July 29, 1994, as part of a plea bargain, Steve pled guilty to the charges of racketeering attempting to burn down a nightclub and for arranging Nick's murder. In return, the other murder for higher charges were dropped. As part of the deal, Steve also had to forfeit his business interests in the Chippendales. Sentencing was scheduled for October 1994, with Steve facing a slightly lesser prison term of up to 26 years. On October the 23rd, 1994, the morning of the sentencing, Steve was found dead in his prison cell at the Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Los Angeles. He had taken his own life. An indecipherable note was found in his cell. Friends of Nick Denoya, who had gathered outside the courthouse for the sentencing, were angry that yet again, Steve had evaded justice for his crimes. Many saw his death as Steve's final scheme, his defence lawyer requested that the prosecution against Steve was abated, arguing that since he was dead, the case against him was over. This meant that all of Steve's assets remained with his family rather than being seized by the government. The man who pulled the trigger on Nick, Gilberto Rivera Lopez, was eventually convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Ray pleaded guilty to conspiracy and murder for hire but, due to his cooperation with the FBI, received a reduced sentence. He completed an additional two years in federal prison and was released in 1996. The Chippendales survived all of the scandals and have changed ownership several times since Steve's death. They currently appear at the Rio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. That concludes today's case. Thanks very much for listening. Please add any comments down below. As always, I'll be interested in reading them. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. 
Steve's son, Christian, now 32, has become a stripper and works within the sex industry. He has followed in his father's footsteps, launching his own male stripper group called The Strippendales. Goodbye.